No, I think some. Oh, I can't use these things. To save my life on them. There we go, right. Yes. Were they? I don't know why they were saying that. <laughs> Is that what you said? One, two, one. <laughs> It just seems a bit... Uh, One, two. No, they don't. This is working now. <laughs> I, I want a velvet jacket. I crave a velvet jacket. We might have to start. Is there, is there anything on this at all? On his way with new batteries. It's um, like 12 o'clock now, I'm just thinking about your time. Do you want to uh, see if you can take these out? I presume you want to walk around. Well, I might do, but again, I don't know how this works. Whether it will work very well. I walk around with you. Yeah. I'm going to stand and read today. I'm going to start from here, so you so might... So it's been recorded for austerity. Is it? It is. Am I on? Yeah, I think I might. So that, that's working. That's working. That's working. Nice. Eager your minds. Can we introduce you? You can do, but I'll, I'll be introducing myself as well, so... No. I'll say something. Just to get people... Just to... Thanks very much. If you don't fancy doing the lecture as well, do you? Yeah, yeah, no, but <laughs> I didn't hide quickly enough before they came. <laughs> you do it, Alan. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. That's what we thought. All right, shall I? Mm, be careful, that's fine. Okay. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Or afternoon, by now. Okay, so it's our very last keynote for this term. And it gives me... Ooh, oh, no. excitement, bated breath, um, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce this morning, this afternoon, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Alan Hodgkinson. Um, you teach primarily in uh, special education, Lee? Yeah. Um, he'll be talking today, and I'll be uh, chairing and hoping for questions uh, following a very stimulating talk, so uh, I look forward to hearing more. Thank you very much. It's always a bit of a, a sort of death wish, isn't it, when someone says stimulating talk at the beginning. Uh, it sets a standard very high that one has to achieve. But we'll try our best. Well, hello, I'm Dr. Alan Hodkinson, as David said. Welcome to this lecture about the humble school textbook. But I would like to start by thanking um, David and the team, Education Studies team, for the kind invitation to speak to you all today about a subject that is close to my heart. My lecture today, then, is about control and employment of knowledge in the attempt not to humanize people, but to subordinate and dominate them. Yes, I accept, as in this slide, that knowledge is about facts and skills, but I also want to concentrate on the last two statements here and build an argument that the simple and humble school textbook could actually be something rather more sinister. My argument here, my contextual axiom is simple, that they who control knowledge control the world. Firstly then, let us consider the humble textbook, the comfortable resource employed by many teachers, and ask whether it indeed is but a harmless teaching tool. Our oh, textbooks then, this friendly, comfortable, warm, fluffy resource used by teachers. Perhaps then, at its most basic level, 
the textbook is just a tool of the trade and one that has a very long history that has been inextricably linked to the rise of modern schooling. As long as there's been schooling, there's been textbooks. So state education has grown up with a textbook as a support to pedagogy. No difficulties here, one might think. <coughs> However, in education studies, one of our main tasks, your task, tutor's task, is to critique to pull back the outer layers of something, the veneer, to reveal what lies beneath. It is from this standpoint that I wish now to interrogate the humble textbook and ask of it some very difficult questions. Primarily, one has to realise that textbooks are a very important resource. As Olsen accounts, pupils can spend some 75% of their classroom time and encounter some 32,000 pages of text in their school careers. So what is actually contained within textbooks and not on mobile phones that some people are using at the moment, which is rather irritating, becomes very important. Within textbooks, Potter argues that what is presented is often seen as many by many as the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Textbooks then can be wheeled out by teachers without criticism to one generation of pupils after the next, again and again and again. However, my argument, and that of others, is actually that textbooks are mechanisms of control. As Texel accounts, Textbooks are created using specialised knowledge that is dominated by the world view and ideological perspectives of those who occupy positions of power. Keep the phrases specialised knowledge and ideological perspectives at the forefront of your thought here. For it is here, I believe, that the importance of the textbook is revealed. Textbooks then could be, actually, something quite sinister in the education of all of our children. Let us now add some meat to this analytical bone. I employ here Crawford's analysis that the textbooks are social constructions based upon a selective tradition of knowledge. It is this selective tradition of what goes in a textbook and what is left out that we should all here have cause for concern because this is where specialised knowledge and ideological perspectives of those creating the textbooks come to the fore. To me, this sounds as though it could just be a little bit sinister. I forward the argument here then that textbooks are actually an instrument of cultural transmission and are, as Stry accounts, instruments of socialization. Here then, textbooks become a way, perhaps, of brainwashing children into believing the official version of knowledge. This notion as textbooks, as instruments of socialization, fascinates me and is one I seek to evidence in the next part of this lecture. Perhaps this is an evil plot of domination in our classrooms. Crawford, a well-known scholar in this area, concurs with Stry arguing that what textbooks actually contain is not the truth, but claims to the truth. Let us now together examine this claim, that it is a claim, in detail. I move now, therefore, to provide some practical examples of the textbooks as instruments of socialization. Let's start by taking a trip around the world to provide some evidence to my argument that textbooks are sinister and evil. Firstly then, in Japan, France, Germany, Hungary and so on on the slide, textbooks are controlled in terms of content. And even in some countries, textbooks are written from within government departments. Why would this be? Why would government want to have such control of the knowledge that their young children experience. 
Is it time to be a little afraid or to indeed be very afraid of what's happening in our classrooms? As Keith Crawford accounts from his research work in Australia, in some nation states, textbooks are used openly and unashamedly to promote specific ideologies and sets of political ideas. In some states, under the guise of patriotism, the history of a nation is served up for public consumption by those who control it. They control the memory. They control what goes in the textbooks. Indeed, in some states, the creation of this national memory is central to the purpose of education. But we should question, as Crawford does, whose memory are they using and how truthful is such a memory? I want now to show you how your national memory, if you've been educated in England, has been altered by the experience of textbooks. If I were to ask the question here today, uh, which was the nurse who came to great fame during the Crimean War, swinging a lamp from side to side and wandering around, I'm sure many of you here would say, of course it's Florence Nightingale. And to some extent this is true. But the real story is based upon Mary Seacole who was just as famous, if not more so at the time, but over the passage of time has been written out of English textbooks because, it is argued by scholars, she was black. It was not until 1995 in the work of Dr. Penelope Harnett that Mary was placed back into some history textbooks, notably those produced by the Ginn history team. In English textbooks, for those of you from Ireland, the Irish famine is just that, a potato blight, meant that the failure of the harvest led to mass starvation, death and migration. What many of the textbooks do not tell us is that during this time there was an actual surplus of food in Ireland and the landowners were exporting such for great profit. The evidence from a study at the University of Lancaster is that the English landowners used the blight as an excuse to clear the land of the populace so that they might grow more crops and raise more sheep. However, that would not make for good reading in a textbook. I'm sure you've all heard of the Blitz spirit during the Second World War of singing, Roll out the barrel, roll out the barrel of fan as the bombs drop down. People huddle together on cold tube platforms, suffering together, singing together, enjoying together. Yes, some of this did actually happen, but in reality, according to Crawford's detailed study of the police reports of the time, muggings, rapes, burglaries, all rose and crime was rife. The blackout had produced a unique climate for the criminal fraternity. Of course, at the time, this could not be reported, but the myth of the Blitz spirit has been reported in many textbooks. Here is another whimsical example of how truth and memory is controlled by state. It is still the case that many people believe that if you eat lots of carrots, you get better night vision. But ah, alas, this is not true. It was a lie put out by the RAF to cover their use to the Germans of radar. But again, for some people, this has become a total truth that has entered into our national psyche. I want now to turn to some research work that I conducted to provide some specific evidence of textbooks in primary schools in England. Perhaps after this, we might move away from thinking that textbooks are a misunderstanding. A few years ago, I com completed a small-scale research study to examine the scope and representation and treatment of disability and disabled people within the textbooks implied with primary age, employed with primary age pupils. The overall aim of the analysis was to uncover whether these books, consciously or unconsciously, represented prejudices or stereotypical ideas about disability or disabled people. The study's analysis of the picture of disability was based upon 96 textbooks, published between 1974 and 2005, all still being used in schools at the time. They covered six areas, literacy, numeracy, science, personal self, health education, religious education, and geography. In total, 3,717 pages were subject to analysis. It was a bit of a strain on the eyes. However, despite the range of data that we looked at, the range of textbooks, there was a paucity of data, a lack of data, 
that referred to disability. Only one short extract from a literacy book from 1976, half a page in relation to bullying from 2000, and finally three short sentences in a science textbook from 1994 were found. This lack of data by itself is very interesting, and it does perhaps suggest to children that disability is not an important issue in England. Despite the limited sample, it is of interest to note the contents of a particular book from the 1970s were still being made available to children in one of the schools. This book was very much a product of its time, and as such employed uh, language in relation to disability, which did nothing to promote respect towards disabled people. For example, a person with multiple disabilities within one story extract was revealed or introduced as this blind deaf and dumb person. Children looking at this. Additionally, three sentences within a science textbook employed a photograph of a male with a visual impairment to discuss, quote, eyes that do not work properly. The final textbook from 2000 was a little better in that it briefly discussed disability in terms of discrimination and bullying. When we turn to look at the photographs and images used in these textbooks, an interesting pattern emerged. Out of the 4,561 images that were analysed in relation to the research within these textbooks, only 0.28% of the sample portrayed anything in relation to disability. Of interest, and perhaps quite shocking, is that out of all of those images in textbooks that these children were using, there was not one image of a playground or a classroom scene that identified within it anybody with disabilities. This, to me, is a shocking result, that the textbooks did not articulate the richness of our society or the people within them. We might ask ourselves, how could inclusive education work if the textbooks from which children work simply omit disabled people? We are not alone in this. In Canada, a study of textbooks in relation to the native Inuit population produced very similar findings of a cultural whisper in terms of the native uh, indigenous people. What these two pieces of research suggest is that those who wrote and edited the textbooks did not see that these issues were important. Okay, enough of England and Canada. Let us move on now to the land of the free, the United States of America, with its notions of democracy and of freedom of speech. Look at this text, if you will. An amazing piece of text. Now here you may observe, writ large, how textbooks are used to create and recreate societal knowledge. Note here, if you will, the phraseology. Textbooks shall not encourage lifestyles deviating from the norm. This, to me, is intensely troubling. So textbooks here define for children the acceptable standards of society. So if you are omitted from the textbooks, are you not acceptable to society? Think back to the research relating to the Inuit people, or that which I just revealed in terms of disability. Or well, this piece of text, which promotes America as a superior nation and to be dictated as such within textbooks. The question we should ask ourselves here is why would a supposedly democratic nation want so much control of textbooks? Another concern to me, based upon the evidence noted on the slide here, is how textbooks might actually contribute to global conflict and continue such by inculcating the next generation into bigoted notions of nationhood. Note, for instance, that Tel Aviv University analyzed textbooks approved by the Ministry of Education and found evidence of victimization and negative stereotyping of Arabs. For example, one Israeli textbook states that they, the Arabs, are extremists and we, the Israelis, are more moderate. They murder indiscriminately and we defend ourselves. Is this a fair reflection of the Palestinian conflict? Does this provide the children with a complete truth? These are not isolated cases. Consider, if you will, this slide, which the same stereotypical notions may be found in Jordan, Syria, and Egypt. So textbooks do present recreated truths, half-truths, and nothing but some truth and lies. Elsewhere in the world at the moment, the Russian government has recently embarked on a rewriting of history textbooks, altering information to provide a different history. It has been suggested that these changes in national memory have already led to direct attacks on Jewish communities. In Japan, 
Their textbooks have been rewritten so that their disgraceful acts in the 1930s in China, uh, designated as the Rape of Nanking, are completely missing from the school textbooks. Back to America. Another classic example of textbooks rewriting history to recreate a sanitized national memory was observed recently. In some American high school textbooks, a story is told about how American settlers helped the Native Americans to get through a very cold winter. They tell in great detail how these new settlers gave the Native Americans food and warm blankets and how they lived together harmoniously. However, despite their very real efforts, the cold and cruel winter wiped out the Native American tribe. Goodness me, this is heart-wrenching stuff. I almost feel like bursting into tears, but I won't. Me mascara might run. Problematically, what the evidence actually shows is the settlers wanted the Native Americans off the land because it was reputed to contain gold and minerals. So the blankets that they gave to the Native Americans were infected with the smallpox virus, a virus new to these people. Destruction of the population was almost total. The settlers got the land they wanted. Not a great story to read for the children studying the history of America, though, this country that is supposed to be superior to all others. I finish my lecture today hopefully having persuaded all of you that the humble, comfortable education textbook should at least be observed in a more critical fashion. And I leave you with this question. If education is about humanizing people, which is what this faculty of education believes, then should we be allowing the children to read the bigoted, stereotypical, and sometimes downright lies that are contained within the textbooks that 75% of classroom time can be spent listening to. Thank you for listening. Sit still. One, two. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much for that lecture. I think it was really exciting to make connections uh, in this lecture with our discussions of a free press. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about should the press be free, uh, the Leveson inquiry, and we tried to connect that with should the education system itself be free, does the national curriculum provide and textbooks provide a perfect opportunity for somebody like Dr. Evil to control us. Okay, so with uh, those thoughts in mind, I'd just love to uh, see if anyone's got a question. I've got a microphone here. So. Come on, somebody must have a question in this first year group. Something must have stimulated interest. If nothing to say, God, what a load of rubbish. Yeah, don't agree with it at all. <laughs> My question is, um, looking at uh, um, education itself, education itself is a social construct. And uh, information, whether it's been written down or not, given information actually have a part of an impact on in humans because you're actually controlling the minds of humans. So my question, therefore, is, is it just the information on the textbooks that, is, that seems to control, or is, is it the information itself? That we've just completed, can everybody hear me there? I feel like I should be rapping, I don't know. Um, we've just completed a study on the intranet, and I naively thought that with it being a more modern media, that we'd have better representations. But actually, school's intranet is more bigoted and more stereotypical than the textbooks were. Because at least, at least the textbooks had some control in terms of editors not doing outlandish things. If you believe the work of Bowles and Gintis from the sort of 70s, all schooling is about is making people conform to society. And I think in that relation, then we do need to, people do control knowledge that way. And we think that living in a democracy like we do in good old England, that actually we, we wouldn't do a lot of that sorts of things, but actually we do. We're one of the worst countries for doing it. America's another one that has more control of its internet in some places than China does. Starts to ask you questions about why. Why we need to control knowledge.
that's a very good question. So maybe, well, I, I wouldn't mind writing some textbooks because there's quite a bit of profit in them. But I actually think maybe it should be teachers in relation to panels of people who actually vet them, people from different parts of our society who vet them. Yeah, because that way at least we'd have some sort of, uh, we could maybe ensure that we could control the more sort of bigoted ideas that get in. So maybe teachers with people helping them, parents and representations of associations and communities and so on. That was a good question considering you were really under duress. Fantastic, you'll go far. Any more questions? Are they normally like this, David? Best not to upset the crowd. No, one more question, I'll be happy. Someone must have a burning question. I'm waiting for the one that I thought I might have got, which is, well, surely one of the things that this presentation accepts as a given is that when people read textbooks, you, you just accept that what's in them is true. But I'm sure you've read stuff in your school career when you've gone, that's a load of rubbish. And I'm sure teachers have read stuff to you from textbooks who said, I don't agree with that. And I'm sure there must be people here because that's what I experienced in my school career. So one of the things that was missing from my presentation on purpose, because I was hoping that somebody would have the question, is the notion of mediation. So it may not be that bigoted notions in textbooks are left isolated and that teachers themselves do mediate it and try to produce a more sort of social uh, equality sort of message in terms of what's in there. That was a good question from the group. I'm glad you asked that one. No more? Well, must be finished the last week before Christmas Day. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Have a great Christmas, everybody. question and answer was perfect. Was it? It was really good. <laughs> And I, I, I think the school textbooks may be on the way and is the notion of the internet, which is why we switch research onto the internet. But actually, as I said there, it's worse. It's a lot worse what we found. We've got a big ESRC grant in at the moment to look at it. Um, got through the re first review. So, I mean, if that went off, that would be brilliant, you know, and sort of get in and start looking at schools and how they... You so see, this is what happens. My, my bloody iPhone's gone down with the timer on. Uh. Ah, well. uh, so, but because uh, I say I was trying really hard not to go over. No, but it was. No, I mean, it was bang on, I think. Bang on, yeah. But I aimed, I, I aimed it to be 18 minutes, and I stopped at 18 and a half. So. so.
It is difficult. I mean, I prefer a lectern. No, I, well, with a, that's I've tilted. Had a lectern. But when you put it on there, of course, it's just going yeah, so to. It's hard to look down, so you need something. Yeah, I mean, actually, yeah. I think the strip seat here sort of works. I don't know. I mean, would, you do, would you use a strip for a normal lectern? No, 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 just because of the length of them. But I mean, I have done. I sometimes do for masters now, just purely to keep me. But I have a, I have a poor memory as a result of a head injury, so some, some days are worse than the others, so yeah. sometimes I do script moves. So, yeah. but, uh, yeah, a good bunch. There's a lot there, actually. Yeah, it's, it's good. good. Mm -hmm. yeah, are these mandatory, then? They yeah. are, man. Yeah. Yes, they're, they're uh, cattle prodded down with electric <laughs> cattle prods from, from sort of Eden. You yeah. see them sort of... From, from the pub down the road. Yeah, whoa, oh, get, oh, oh, get in there. Well, we've got a 15 minute turn now, so let's start with the 42. You see, that's, very, uh, that's good timing, then. We've, we've kept... That's, that's a first for yeah, me. That's, that's good. Well, it looks really good, I thought, and perfectly actually connecting with all sorts of mm. elements within the course. Mm. It's right. normally a good one for Ed Studies, that one, because it brings everything to yeah. play mm. in something they can conceptualise because they've all been through it, you know. Mm. So, I used to do one on creation of national memory, and Rag did a thing, 10 points to total domination of education in a sort of right-wing dictatorship, and mm. a great lecture you based around there, and we got to sort of 9 out of the 10 in England, you know, whereas some socialist countries have only got as far as 5, you know. But the first thing that most countries do if they have a really good revolution, especially those when I'm in Vietnam, is so you kill your teachers, get a new life, so and you burn the again. textbooks, yeah, start yeah. again. So that's another lecture. Mm. But, uh, <laughs> so one of the first things you do, kill, kill your teachers and burn mm. your textbooks, start again. And one of the things I would have been quite interested to know about, you know, how, you know to, to what extent is it all state control? Is it all ideology? Does some, does some myths just... Just, just see, see through. Just through. Some see just through. Keep, you know, and yeah. It's a matter of repetition and, and you know, this collective. It's like a, a thing. whisper yeah. thing that yeah. if, if you it's say it often enough, it becomes, it becomes true. true. I mean, so that's the carrot one. I mean, yeah. it's, that's it's, a. It's, it's not always kind yeah. of. You know, mm. it, 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 sometimes there can be misunderstanding, I guess, is what, well, yeah. presumably. Yeah. Would, you know. There is sometimes misunderstanding, like there is in all history, where mm. things are misquoted and mis misinterpreted but and all the rest of it. They get jumped on by people with agendas. Yeah. What's real? Go. No, just so you're getting out of it, it's not always pathological. No, so I, 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 think you're, no I think it would be wrong to say that in totality, but then when you look at it in the cold light of day, mm. it's, I think that a lot of it is that a lot of textbooks in our country are written by white middle-class males, mm. and so you get yeah. a certain, yeah, yeah that, that feeds yeah. in, yeah. that leeches in. But interestingly, the work started, I mean, I, I do one where I show exam questions from German textbooks before the war, which is amazing the way it yeah. uses, you know, no, exactly to, 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 to construct yeah. disability as evil and all the rest of it. And mm -hmm. you've got Lee, Lee, Rosa Leibniz taking photographs and things. But anyway, um, it started at the George Eckhart Institute after the war because they were so determined that textbooks would never be used again in Germany mm -hmm. to sort of, you know, create... They sort of say, why, why did the, the Holocaust happen? It's because education started a good time before making sure that people saw others as mm -hmm. not worthwhile. And so... Come in, love the hat. There's the hat, love the hat. <laughs> so, um, yeah. No idea. I think, I think you just sort of just, when, you, when enough people fall over, dead. And you sort of, yeah. But yeah, the, the work of George Eckhart is fantastic. He used to have a, um, a German professor used to speak who'd been through the concentration camps. My God, she was powerful. And she was one of the, I think she'd be dead now. And she used to do this whole thing on the word tolerance, about how she sees tolerance being used a lot in education, but that's just a power. Yes. A power metric, and yeah. Uh, yeah. they tolerated us in 1933. You know, we, we're going to be tolerated. So. Mm -hmm. But it's, there's a wealth of information here for, for presentations yeah. for students. I'm going to go for no, one, oh, I, I wouldn't I listen. To, I wouldn't listen <laughs> to this nonsense again. No, no, no it's really interesting. <laughs> and I'll probably see you around. Yeah, you must, I mean, I we'll do coffee. If, won't if you, so. you want me to, I, can, I will sort of yeah. show you my. Yeah, we must do. A, yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's, let's go after Christmas. Get settled down, and then we'll go on. Hiya. I've got to do this. This is the second time I've done this. Mm. Well, Bart did one last week, didn't he? That's the way to do it. I, I, that's definitely the way to do it. I'm not happy, it'll be over with soon. Okay. <laughs> oh, hiya. Let's see, is anybody waiting outside? Might be nobody. Mm.
Bobo. And who would leave Maltesers here, mind you? Got this full. Mm. I guess on, on this one we're not quite as rushed, are we? Because we've got nothing to put in it. Yeah, that's right. Oh, here's trouble. Look at these. Mm. <laughs> you know um, these. Yeah. Mm. Oh, dear. Uh, yeah. Maybe the heating is on this because everything's so essential on this. So I'm looking for something. Oh, I can't see. Because uh, there's a. Um, on the, uh, the, the, the touch. I don't tend to touch the touch screens because things <laughs> sort of seem to go wrong. You know, is that possible? That's, that's just the lights, isn't it? Oh, nearly Christmas. Lights. What's that up at the back? It's never this handy. And it is. Bob Bottom. 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 No camera controls. Hopefully the speaker's all right. I've heard it's rubbish. Oh, it's rubbish. Oh. And essay's back tomorrow. Hello? Essay's back tomorrow. Going yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. Has anyone failed? I think everybody failed. No, oh, no, really? I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay. No, no. It's the truth is Yeah, absolutely. It's all my okay. No, nobody failed. Okay. No, but nobody failed. No. That's good. So, so that is good. So, yeah, there's a whole range. So we'll, what we're just going to do tomorrow is put um, Give, it, give them back and then talk about generalistics and then if anybody wants to ask any specifics when everybody else is going we can do that and that's it home for christmas unless you've got something on friday then. no she's cancelled it she said in the lecture she was like oh who's going to come to the session on friday and about two people put their hands up so she's like all right let's leave it yeah because we've got the carol thing you see at three o'clock so and carol sings very well at three o'clock on the last day whoever carol is and there must be more than one of them because it says carol's carol's singing Unless they just missed out the apostrophe and it was actually one individual. Maybe it was just a, a really bad attempt at um, punctuation, I don't know. I don't know Carol though. I don't know Carol either. I believe she's very good. She gets asked back every year. <laughs> Have you seen the sheep in the advent thing in the faculty? The the faculty day? Yeah, have you seen the sheep? No. No, you've got to go the sheep. The sheep. There's a sheep there. I'm not saying who owns the sheep, but there we go. I love the sheep. We once did a play, a passion play in the school where Jesus and all the rest of them were mic'd up and halfway through the presentation in the church with the bishop there and all the rest of the audience, whoa, God, that's good. And the kid left his mic on as he went to the toilet. It was a particularly, it was a particularly difficult moment for the bishop as we're all waving our palm leaves, you know. Oh, yeah. wasn't good. Um, lots of people in here I don't know. Hmm. <coughs> Cruising. Education studies? Who come in? Education studies, anybody? No? Oh, thin on the ground for the second session. Thin on a small. Mm. Is it? Ah. Uh, I'll stand up to the first one. I could have done all that, couldn't I? <laughs>
And I'm expecting questions at the end. I'll be I'll be picking on people. No, I won't. It's a bit. You've obviously never seen me lecture more than once. I just I lose the plot. I just get really dizzy. Will you do a keynote for level C? Oh, all right then. And that's it. No, they just said you can do what you want, which is always dangerous when you let me do what I want. Mm. Well, it's got to sort of, sort of relate to what you're doing on the education studies program, but this this always will on any. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the, I actually know that I'm thinking about the discipline. The keynote is meant to be much looser. So much looser. That was always the idea as an enrichment activity. So. Okay. Pardon? I'm not surprised, I don't like looking myself most mornings. So. Oh dear. Oh, I'm quite excited thin. to get those things back tomorrow. How are you? Uh, it's been really quick. When I, when I was in, in, at university, 13, 25, you got an essay about the same year and you were doing well. Sometimes you just never got them back. Yeah. It's really bizarre. So all this four week turnaround is really strange. Yeah, and there's not enough tutors on the program. Like each essay? Yes, all oh, they're all marked. Yeah. Glorious technical. Like, like you just pick one randomly and then. No, there are some places that would do that. They pick certain ones and then judge and then someone else pick certain ones. But no, everyone is marked page by page. When people put them in those plastic folders one page at a time, which takes about 30 seconds to get out and put back in again, and then you multiply that by the the essay itself, which could have about 20 of those. So 20 times 30 seconds is like 10 minutes. And then you multiply that by 30 in the group. I spend a lot of time just doing that and getting really irritated. Just go. <laughs> I'm saying nothing. There's some really good ones. And there's some really lots of good ones. So there's a whole Because it's a different form of essay. It's much, it's more academic, this one. That's a university-wide policy. You have to do a five percent one very early on, and it's good because we can check things and sort of say, "God, don't do that," and "God, don't do that," sort of thing. These ones don't count once you do the next five today, really. Well, no, they don't because you could lift yeah. your mark up. Yeah, that's the idea. Is that the the idea is that you do get better. What really interests me is we get no hours for formative marking, so bringing them in, we get no hours for that. Which is, I think, that's really interesting. You only get one set of hours for the final mark. Only for the, only for the final one. You get hours for that. You don't get any. Uh, all of that is done because tutors feel it's important. So that's not part of your hours. Then it starts to add up. You see, you start to think. You know why tutors walk around like this? Good, mm, good. Mm. So uh, I thought we started. Do we start a quarter? Two? I better start. Uh, you know, David. I'll just start without David for a laugh. Shh. It'll be over with soon. It's okay. I'll try and be as quick as I can. You know, don't want to keep here any longer than you should need to be. Education studies? Do come in. Anybody else for education studies? Come on, quarter two. Unless you've been at another lecture, then I forgive all of you. Education studies? Any more for any more? No. Oh, it's filling up nicely, isn't it? Obviously heard I was giving away free sweets, I don't know. Now the judge said they'd stop that. Wait for David to introduce me. Do come in. One cross each, line to the left. So the doors would have been locked. Mm. And my first university, I continually arrived, arrived late. I used to, you had to stand outside the dean's office. 
Yeah, and she wasn't called Dean either. Maybe she was a friend of Carol, I don't know. Education studies, come on. Quick, quick, quick. Beat, beat. Max do again, see Chanel. Education studies, uh, do come in. Look happy, it'll be over with soon. Ah, uh, this is more like it. Just when I was beginning to think nobody was gonna come and listen. Do ed, ed studies? Yeah, good, good, good. Top, top. To, uh, you may. Practice yes. Do I need to turn this off then? Or just see if it's on. Uh, this is off. That's all. We can use that. Good morning. Afternoon. Sorry. Afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the final keynote lecture for this year. Um, today it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alan Hodgkinson, Associate Professor, uh, who specialises, as some of you well know, in special educational needs. Um, and he's going to talk to us about the humble textbook. Thank you very much. Ah, well, as David said, hello, I'm Dr. Alan Hodkinson, and welcome to this lecture about the humble school textbook. I'll start with this uh, poem, as I've got a bit more time. Knowledge is like light, weightless and tangible. It can easily travel the world, enlightening the lives of people everywhere. I would like at this juncture to take the opportunity to thank David and the Education Studies team for the kind invitation to speak to you today uh, about the subject or a subject that is close to my heart. My lecture today then is about control and about the employment of knowledge in the attempt to not humanise people but to subordinate and dominate them. Yes, I accept that knowledge is about facts and skills as here on this slide but I want to concentrate on the last two statements on the slide and build an argument that the simple and perhaps humble school textbook could actually be something rather more sinister. My argument here then, my contextual axiom is simple, that they who control knowledge control the world. Firstly then, let us all together consider the humble school textbook the comfortable resource employed by many teachers, and ask whether indeed it is but a harmless teaching tool. Perhaps textbooks then are just a friendly, comfortable, cuddly little thing that teachers use caringly to promote and develop education. At its most basic level then, the textbook is just a tool of the trade used by teachers, one that has a very long history that has been tied inextricably to the rise of the modern schooling. As long as we've had state education in this country, we have had the textbook. So, state education has grown up with the textbook as a support to pedagogy. No difficulties here, one might think. However, in education studies, one of our, that's you, and tutors' main task is to critique, to pull back the outer layers, the veneer of something, to reveal what lies beneath. It is from this standpoint that I now wish to interrogate the humble school textbook and ask of it some very difficult questions. Primarily, we have to realise that textbooks are an important resource within the school classroom. As Olson here accounts, pupils can spend some 75% of their classroom time and encounter some 32,000 pages of text in their school careers. So what is actually contained within the textbooks becomes very important to all of our children. Within the textbooks then, Potter argues that what is presented is often seen as many as the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Textbooks then can be wheeled out without criticism to one generation after the next, showing the same information time and time again. Information that's not available at this time on mobile phones. 
no matter how good you are with your typing on your keyboards. Mm, I can see you. However, my argument and that of others is that textbooks are mechanisms of control. And as taxol accounts are created using specialized knowledge that is dominated by the worldview and ideological perspectives of those occupying the preeminence in society who have the power. Keep the phrases specialized knowledge and ideological perspectives at the forefront of your thought here, for it is here, I believe, that there is a concern. Textbooks, then, could be something quite sinister in the education of our children. Let us now, though, add some meat to this analytical bone. I employ here Keith Crawford's analysis that textbooks are social constructions based upon a selective tradition. It is this selective tradition of what goes in and what is left out of textbooks that we all here should have a cause for concern because this is where the specialised knowledge and ideological perspectives comes to the fore. To me, this does sound just a little bit sinister. I forward the argument here then that textbooks are in fact an instrument of cultural transmission and are, as Stry accounts, instruments of socialization. I feel like I should go dum dum dum, but I won't. Here then textbooks become a way perhaps of brainwashing children into believing the official version of knowledge. This notion of textbooks as instruments of socialization fascinates me and is one I seek to evidence in the next part of my lecture. Perhaps then, it is an evil plot. Crawford then, this well-known scholar from the uh, University of Sydney, um, who's spent a long lifetime researching textbooks, concurs with Stry, arguing that textbooks contain not the truth, but claims to truth. Let us now together turn to examine the claim that textbooks have claims to truth in a bit more detail. I move that now, therefore, to provide some practical examples to you all here of the textbooks as an instrument of socialization. Let us together take a trip around the world to provide evidence to support my argument. Firstly, then, in Japan, France, Germany, Hungary, and so on, textbooks are controlled in terms of content. And even in some countries, textbooks are written from within government departments. Why would this be? Why would government want to have such control of the knowledge that their young children experience? Is it time to be afraid, to be very afraid? In some nation states, as Keith Crawford accounts, textbooks are used openly and unashamedly to promote specific ideologies and sets of political ideas. In some states, under the guise of patriotism, the history of a nation served up for public consumption is that which the leaders of the country, the government, determine that it should be. The question that Crawford asks is, whose national memory are they using? How truthful is such a memory? I want now to show you, for those of you who have been educated in England, how your national memory has been altered by your experience of English textbooks. If I were to ask, for example, who was the nurse during the Crimean War swinging the lamp around, I'm sure that many of you here would say Florence Nightingale. God love her. And yes, to some extent, this is true. However, in reality, Mary Seacole was just as famous, if not more famous at the time. Here she is pictured at the top right but was written out of English textbooks because many scholars argued she was black. It was not until 1995 in the work of Dr. Penelope Harnett that Mary was placed back into some history textbooks, notably the Ginn History Scheme. In English textbooks, for those of you here from Ireland, you don't need to cheer, the Irish famine is just that. A potato blight meant that the failure of the harvest led to mass starvation, death and migration. What many of the textbooks do not tell us during this time is that actually there was a surplus of food that the English landowners were exporting and making great profit from. 
There is evidence from the study at the University of Liverpool that English landowners simply used the blight as an excuse to clear their land so that they might grow more crops and raise more sheep. That would not make for good reading, though, in an English textbook, one thinks. I'm sure you've heard, all heard of the Blitz spirit during the Second World War, of people singing, Roll out the barrel, roll out the barrel of fan tooth. No, OK. Um, of people huddled together on tube platforms for warmth, singing and dancing and merriment as the bombs rained down. Yes, some of this did happen. But in reality, according to Crawford's detailed study of police reports from the time, muggings, rapes, burglaries, all rose and crime was rife. The blackout had produced a unique climate for the criminal fraternity. Of course, at the time, this could not be reported. But the myth of the Blick spirit has become a total truth reported in some textbooks. Here is another whimsical example of how truth and memory is controlled by the state. It is still the case that many people believe that eating carrots aids your night vision. But oh, alas, this is not true. It was a lie put out by the RAF during the Second World War to cover their use of the new radar system to the Germans. But again, this has become, to some, a total truth that has entered into our national psyche. I want now to turn to some research work that I conducted a few years ago into textbooks and provide specific evidence of how in England the uh, issue of disability and impairment is treated. Perhaps you are still thinking at this point that textbooks are just a simple misunderstanding. So here the evidence hopefully will pull you away from that point of view. In this small-scale research, I examined the scope and the representation and treatment of disability and disabled people within textbooks employed by primary age children in and around Liverpool. The overall aim of this analysis then was to uncover whether these sample textbooks consciously or unconsciously promoted or represented prejudices and stereotypical ideas in respect of disability or disabled people. The study's analysis of the picture of disability was based upon a sample of 96 textbooks commonly employed by teachers in primary school classrooms. And these were published between 1974 and 2005. The vast majority of the sample was from 1990 onwards. They covered very many areas of the curriculum for those of you studying teaching here. Literacy, numeracy, science, PSHE, religious education and geography. In total, 3,717 pages was subject to analysis. Yeah, my eyes hurt, but there we go. Despite the range of findings and the amount of text contained within the sample, there was, however, a paucity, a lack of data which referred to disability. Indeed, only one short story extract from a literacy book published in 1976, half a page from a literacy book from 2000, and three short sentences in a science book were actually found. This lack of data by itself is interesting. Does it perhaps suggest to children that disability is not an important issue in England? Despite this limited sample, it is of interest to note that the contents of one particular book from the 1970s, still readily being made available to children in one school, uh, was, uh, here was a very much a product of its time, as it employed language in relation to disability which did nothing to promote respect towards disabled people. For example, in this textbook, a person with multiple disabilities was introduced within one story extract as this blind, deaf and dumb person. Additionally, three sentences found within a science textbook employed a photograph of a male with a visual impairment to discuss, quote, eyes that do not work properly. The final textbook from 2000 was perhaps a little better in that it briefly, very briefly, discussed disabilities in terms of discrimination and bullying. When we looked at the photographs and images used in textbooks as a whole, out of the 4,561 images analysed in the textbooks, only 0.28% of the sample portrayed images of disability. And what was really disturbing and concerning was that out of the numerous images of the playground and classroom that were used and employed sorry, in these textbooks, there was not one single image of a disabled person. Not one. In a classroom scene, in a playground scene, in a swimming lesson scene, not one. 
This, I think, is quite a shocking result, that the textbooks did not articulate to our children, the next generation, the richness of our society, nor the people that make up that society. We might ask ourselves, how could inclusive education work if the textbooks from what, which children read and work omit disabled people? We are, though, not alone in terms of this cultural whisper. In Canada, a study of textbooks in relation to the native Inuit population reveal very similar findings. You simply did not exist in the textbook if you are from the Inuit population. What these two pieces of research suggest to me is that those who wrote and edited the textbooks did not see these issues as important. Okay, enough of England and Canada. Let us move on to the land of the free, the United States of America. <clears throat> With its notions of democracy, and of freedoms of speech. Look at this, if you will. Wow. So examine, if you will, this amazing piece of text. Now here you may observe, writ large, how textbooks are used to create and recreate societal knowledge. Note here, if you will, the phraseology towards the end. Textbooks should not encourage lifestyles that deviate from the norm. This is, to me, intensely troubling. So textbooks here define for children the acceptable standards of society. So if you are omitted from textbooks, are you not acceptable to society? Think back to my research on disability, or indeed that of the Inuit people. What message is being conveyed to children? Or look at this text, which promotes America, and to be promoted in textbooks, America as the superior nation, above all others. The question we should ask ourselves here is why would a supposedly democratic nation want so much control of its textbooks? What's the point? Another concern to me based upon the evidence noted in this slide is how textbooks might actually contribute to global conflict and continue such by inculcating the next generation into bigoted notions of nationhood. Note, for instance, the Tel Aviv University analyzed textbooks approved by their Ministry of Education, the Israeli one, and found evidence of victimization and the negative stereotyping of Arabs. For example, one Israeli textbook states that they, the Arabs, are extremist, and we, the Israelis, are the moderates. They murder indiscriminately, and we defend ourselves. Is this a fair reflection of the Palestinian conflict? Does this provide to children a complete truth? These are not isolated cases. Consider, if you will, this slide, which reveals the same bigoted and stereotypical notions may be found in Jordan, Syria, and Egypt. Indeed, in some textbooks pr promoted in some of these countries, Israel simply doesn't exist on the map. It's not there. So textbooks do present recreated truths, half-truths, and nothing but some truth and some lies. Elsewhere, the present Russian government has recently embarked on a rewriting of his, its history textbooks, altering information to provide a different history. It has already been suggested that these changes in national memory have led directly to attacks on Jewish, Jewish communities. In Japan, the same happened when they rewrote their textbooks, um, and that Japan's influence in China in the 1930s, such as the Rape of Nanking, is completely now missing from their textbooks what Japan did to China during the 1930s. Back to America, another classic example of textbooks rewriting history to recreate a sanitized national memory was observed recently. In some American high school textbooks, a story is told of how the American settlers helped the Native American tribes to get through a very cold winter. They tell in great detail how the settlers gave the Native Americans food and warm blankets and how they lived together harmoniously. However, no. Oh. Despite their efforts, the cold and cruel winter wiped out the Native American tribe. This is heart-rending stuff. I feel like I should be gushing with tears. God, those, those settlers, weren't they good? However, and problematically, what the actual evidence shows us is that the settlers wanted the Native American tribe off the land because it was reputed to contain gold and minerals. So the blankets that they gave to the tribe were infected by the settlers with the smallpox virus. 
a virus new to these people. Destruction of the population was almost total. The settlers got the land they wanted. Not a great story to read for the children studying the history of America, this country that is supposed to be superior to all others. I finish my lecture today, hopefully having persuaded you sat here, that the humble, comfortable education textbook should at least be observed in a more critical fashion. And I leave you with this question. If education is about humanizing people, as this faculty absolutely fundamentally believes, then should we be allowing children to read the bigoted, stereotypical, and sometimes downright lies that are contained within textbooks that 75% of classroom time can be spent upon. Thank you for listening. Hello. Okay. Thank you very much uh, to Dr. Hoskinson for that fantastic lecture. Um, and I wanted to just um, connect the, these ideas with uh, the discussions we've been having about a free press and the Lefson inquiry. Um, hopefully, uh, many of you uh, will remember the reading group. Of course, some of you m weren't here, I think, for that. But we've been discussing <laughs> uh, sorry, whether the free press uh, is, is a good idea and whether, indeed, the education system is free or whether we're all being controlled by somebody like Dr. Evil, perhaps David Cameron. All right, at this point, I'd like to uh, uh, open the floor to questions. So I encourage everybody to, to uh, ask away. If you say in the, um, the representation of disabilities in terms of the images and textbooks is far too low, what percentage do you think? Of the images should represent it, considering That's the actual representation. Mm -hmm. That's a very good there are some, oh, thank you, David. I, I said in the last group, I feel like I should be doing a rap now. But there are some people that argue in terms of representations that it should mirror the Registrar General's classification and the National uh, Statistical Survey, which can show as much as 80% of people in our country have a disability of some way, shape, or form. Interesting. What's interesting is in terms of gender in textbooks, yeah, that has become more 50-50, although it's still not there. In terms of representation of minority ethnic heritage, since the legislation of the sort of 80s and, and so on, that's began to grow. And almost like the jokes we heard about Ricky Gervais recently, you can't make jokes about certain things, but it's okay to have a go at the mong down the road. It's almost as though we're still stuck there in terms of textbooks, that it's okay not to represent society fully. So in terms of a percentage, well, I think it should be more even, shouldn't it? I think you should represent, if we walk around this campus today, we will see people with disabilities and impairments. If you walk around society, you'll see them. To have textbooks that have none whatsoever, I think is really problematic. And you would have thought, and it's a good question, that in a scene from a playground or a classroom, you'd have someone with disabilities, considering that you know textbooks are being written, inclusive education is with us, but they're simply not there. So. I can't give a specific percentage, but it, it should be a heck of a lot more than it is. That's a, that's a really interesting one. I mean, some people argue, and it was really perplexing to me when I went around the reading groups early on, that a lot of people are saying in the reading groups that government control of education is a good thing because everybody gets the same. And that's one of the things that people promote as positive about textbooks. They all get the same syllabus. And at one level, that's your positive. Now, of course, being an education studies tutor, then I go, well, yeah, if someone controls all the knowledge, then it's right for altering and changing. I mean, we could get into loads of discussions about Bomber Harris in the Second World War and how that's been portrayed and so on and so forth. The positive thing about textbooks is that everybody gets the same. Is that okay? I've, I've managed to find one positive. And um, I think that, no, I can't even say they're getting cheaper now, but uh, here's another positive, that when the ex it, it does depend on the board, absolutely. But if you actually study them, the biggest study's been done by um, Crawford, hundreds and hundreds of textbooks, many more than my studies, it is absolutely across the board that national memory is recreated. If you take something about, in textbooks about representations of Germany and its people, 
Yeah, that's another one that's totally controlled. You know, it's all the old bit about the Liverpool comedian about those certain types of playing that bombed his granny on the loo, which I'm not going to mention because it might be misinterpreted. Yeah, do you, do you know that joke about the planes that bombed his granny on the loo? Yeah, it be, I won't do that one. But 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 it is that. So they control the, the message in terms of Germany, its people, and as well disabilities. Another one, gender in history textbooks presented to primary school children. A lot of them, all you see is the uh, females tied to the sink. Yeah, or troublesome like Boudicca and so on. Good question. Any other questions? Let's do one more. I'm looking to my group now because tumbleweed rolls across the floor as I stand here. In front of you. There must be one more question. I was expecting one more question. Didn't get it from the last group. There was what? Oh, good. I can hear something. You're right. Hold on. Do you like Jeremy Kyle now? <laughs> when <Sorry>. they. <laughs> So when they make a textbook, <laughs> it's okay, don't worry. How do they do it then? Like, what are they meant to do? Because like you said, you studied, did you do numeracy? Done numeracy. How do you do, in, like, talk about disability in a numeracy textbook? Good question. I'm glad that's from my group. Well, in, I don't know I moved away. Um, in numeracy textbooks, for example, very often illustrations are used to exemplify word problems very common of our year four that a lot of maths goes into word problems in textbooks in, in schools. And then little sort of um, pictures of schoolyards yeah, are, are used. And also, you could easily put them in there. Yes. That's what's called prototext analysis, where you look for issues. So the first thing you look for is, is actually disability being mentioned? And actually, in most te textbooks, it isn't. And if it is mentioned, how is it mentioned? So in the three little bits that we found, the two major ones use disability in terms of the medical model that, you know, it's all your fault, you're going to be cured and all the rest of it. The language is interesting. In some work we've just done on the intranet, it was really interesting about one textbook, well, well one electronic textbook spoke to children about children with disabilities being allowed back into school if a physiotherapy deemed that was okay. So it's the usage of the language, professionals allowing children and not children and parents deciding when they can go back. So that's what you do in terms of the text. Well, in terms of, we could do it in terms of the photographs, that's certainly what, or you could work in examples about uh, mass. So, for, interestingly, in German textbooks before the war, I knew we'd get to it, in the Nazi regime, one of the first things they did to undermine the notion of disabled people in society was start to include questions that contain references. So here's a classic one. When I think about 1933, my memory doesn't escape me, and it went something like this. If it cost 10,000 Reichsmarks to keep a mentally impaired person for one year, but a marriage loan is 2,500 Reichsmarks, how many uh, marriage loans can you give instead of keeping one mentally defective person alive? Now, the importance of that is really interesting. People, we've had this conversation before, but some people say, how could the Holocaust happen? Well, one of the things you do if you want to kill off a group of people is dehumanize them within textbooks. If we look at a lot of revolutions around the world in Vietnam and so on, the first thing they do when totalitarian powers come to, uh, come to control is they burn the original textbooks and they kill off all the teachers and create a new national memory. Yeah. So I was a bit worried when Cameron came to control, just in case he killed off all the teachers and burnt the textbooks. But anyway, so that's how you do it. You dehumanize people. So one of the things we can to promote a positivity, or in terms just to show the richness of our society, is to include everybody in the textbooks. And it can be done because some countries do do that, and they make sure that that happens. Thank you very much. Have a great Christmas, everybody.